So in 1 Samuel chapter 21, there's a few things uh, in this chapter that are of interest. I don't really want to spend too much time on some of the semantics that people get involved in on whether or not David was in sin or was, in, or, was or was not in sin in eating the showbread. We'll definitely talk about that here. But uh, I think the greater lesson that we can learn from this chapter is the fact that even great men of God have lapses in faith. And I believe that's what we see taking place in this chapter. Uh, we'll get into that uh, as we go along here. But let's just start out in verse 1. It says there, Then came uh, David to Nob, to Ahimelech the priest. And Ahimelech was afraid at the meeting of David and said unto him, Why art thou alone and no man with thee? So right away he says this is unusual. You have to remember that David at this point had become a captain in Saul's army. People are used to seeing him come out to go to battle. This might explain why he's afraid. He might say, oh, what's David doing here? Why, what, what's going on? And then, of course, he notices, why art thou alone and no man with thee? So it kind of shows us that the fact that Ahimelech, you know, seems to be unaware of the conflict between David and Saul. And, you know, and that's going to come, and that's going to be an important thing to remember when we get into uh, the chapter next week. There's a couple things that are mentioned here in this chapter that are of a significance next week. Uh, I don't want to preach that ahead of time, but... Uh, it's, it's interesting to note that he says, hey, why are you here alone? I mean, obviously, the obvious answer would have been, well, because I'm running, I'm running for my life from Saul. Okay? Well, the only reason why he would ask that, it seems, would be because he's not aware of the fact that Saul has set about to kill him, that he's fleeing from his master, that he's on the run, that he's fleeing for his life. And it also shows us that, that David is, you know, and of course in the context of the, of, the, of the chapter, we understand that David has other men with him. And he's saying he's alone, alone in the sense of where are all your men? Why, where's this band of men that you normally lead about? Why aren't you, are you going out to war? What's going on here? It was just a very unusual circumstance that Ahimelech took notice of and of course brings it up and asks him this question. And then David, of course, is, uses that circumstance to, you know, disguise the truth or what we would call lying, Right. He uses this to kind of, well, he doesn't know what's going on, and Himlech doesn't know what's going on. But rather than tell the truth, he kind of starts, he, basically he's lying. I mean, there's no really other nice way to say it. I mean, David in this chapter is lying. Now, now was that wrong for him to lie? Yes, it was. It's never, it's never the, the, the right thing to do, obviously, but you can understand his motive. You can understand that he's trying to save his neck. You know, he's trying not to... Uh, have, you know, have himself, he's trying to stay alive, basically. He's just trying to survive at this point, even to the point where, you know, he's asking for food. You know, he's gotten to the point, he's on the run. They didn't bring any provision with them. They didn't bring any weapons with them. He's just on the run. He's in a desperate situation. And what we see here is that you think, oh, David, you know, lying, what's going on here? And what it shows us is that even great men of God have lapses in faith. I mean, is there any need for David to worry about anything that's going to take place? No, he knows that the Lord is on it. He should know at least at this point in his life that the Lord is with him, that the Lord is on his side, that the Lord can deliver him at any moment. But we see him kind of going through a lapse of faith here, don't we, in this chapter. And David, he kind of, dis- he's, he's starting to lie here. Now, I will say, you know, lying is a wicked thing, but, you know, often you have to kind of, and I'm not trying to preach any kind of situational ethics here, it's always wrong, but, you, all, you know, sometimes you kind of give people a little bit more slack when they do bad things based on their motive. You know, what was going on? What circumstance were they in? You know, David's not lying as a malicious act here. You know, he didn't go out of his way to try and fool, you know, Ahimelech. He didn't concoct this big conspiracy. I'm going to get, I'm going to get Saul mad at me so that I can go get some free bread from the priest. You know, that's not, this isn't some malicious act on his behalf. He's just in the moment, lapse of faith, and uh, a lie comes out. And this is what happens when we you know, when we, when we lack faith often, is that we'll just start, you know, saying things, trying to even, you know, especially when people are kind of getting cornered and might feel like they're needing to, you know, defend themselves in some way. If they're being confronted about something that they don't want to be confronted about, a lot of times they'll lie to try to get out of it. And he's saying, well, why, why are you, you know, where, where's everybody else? You know, why are you here? What do you mean you have bread? What do you mean you have a sword? Well, you know, I was sent away on the king's... Uh, business here. That's what he says in verse 2. He says, and David said unto him, unto him like the priest, the king hath commanded me a business. That's not true at all. That's not at all what happened. He has said unto me, let no man know anything of the business where I said to him. He's saying, look, it's confidential. I could tell you, but then I'd have to kill you. It's that kind of a thing. You know, it's like, I'd love to tell you what's going on here, but you know, it's top secret. It's classified. You know, I can't, I can't let you in on it. He said, let no man know anything of the business whereabout I send thee. 
and, I, and what I have commanded thee, and I have appointed my servants to such and such a place. So David, you know, yes, he's lying in this chapter more than once. We'll see that again. But he's not doing it maliciously. And I'm not saying he's right for doing it. It is a lapse of faith. But he, remember, David, at this point in his life, is just trying to stay alive. He's just trying to starve, or trying to survive, rather, even to the point of needing food. Okay? And if you would, go over to Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2, because Jesus, you know, he cites this story in um, you know, Matthew, Mark, and Luke when he's dealing with the Pharisees. And, uh, but it's, it's interesting, the wording that was used there, it kind of sheds light on what's going on here. We can see that, that David he had a sincere need, that he really was in a, at a desperate point in his life when this takes place. <coughs> Again, not saying that it was right what he did, but saying it's understandable from a human perspective. Humanly speaking, we can say, oh, well, you know, what would we do in that similar circumstance? Would we have the faith? Would we have the integrity to, to tell the truth? when someone asks us what's going on, if we were in that circumstance. His, his need is, is sincere. Look at uh, Mark chapter 2, verse 23. And it came to pass that he, of course, Jesus, went through the corns of fields on the Sabbath day, and his disciples began as they went to pluck the ears of corn. And the Pharisees said unto them, Behold, why do they on the Sabbath day that which is not lawful? And he said unto them, Have you never read what David did? When he had need and was and hungered, he and they that were with him, how he went to the house of God in the days of Abiathar, the high priest. So same story. I know the names change there. It's just, you know, names change over time. Pronunciations change over time, so on and so forth. Same story, though, okay? But notice what he says. This is G Jesus speaking. He said, he had need and was in hungered. So, you know, Jesus is speaking the truth, of course. We know he's always telling the truth. So we can take it to the bank that when David is going to uh, him like the high priest and saying, hey, I don't have any food. I'm hungry. I have need. That that is, indeed, that is exactly what's going on here. David has a very sincere need, you know, but also at the same time, that doesn't, uh, you know, that doesn't uh, do away with the fact that he still had, a, he had a, a lapse in faith, you know, and it's easy to say we have faith when everything's going great. It's easy to say that we're going to, oh, we're always going to obey God. We're always going to do the right thing. We're always going to tell the truth when everything's going well and, e and everything's going good and life is easy. But it's when you get in a real circumstance and you get your back is up against the wall, like David, and when you're in a, in a tough spot, that's when you start to see how much faith people really have. And unfortunately for David in the story, you know, it's recorded for everyone to see, he stumbles a little bit here. He slips up. And of course, he recovers later in life, we know, and he's a great man of God. And hopefully he doesn't take me aside in heaven and, and give me a what for over this sermon. You know, but... Uh, <coughs> Again, I don't, I, we can't, who, who, who in here could say that we would behave any better in David's circumstance? You know, I'm, I mean, if someone ever threw a jab at me, I'd probably, you know, I, I'd probably curl up and, and start wailing. I'd get in the field position or something. I, I don't know. You know, I, who knows how any of us would behave if someone were actually after our life. But we see here from this chapter in Mark that David is, has a sincere need. If you would, go over to Matthew chapter 12, Matthew chapter 12. And people, you know, often they get into the, and, and again, like I said in the beginning, I really, I really don't want to get into the whole semantics of, you know, what was Jesus exactly saying? Was he excusing David? Was it wrong? Was it right what David did? I believe that it, we'll see here, it's very clear that it was not lawful what he did, but that there is also some, some clauses there that are involved. And people can weigh these things out, you know, and people get in, they want to write whole sections and books about this and commentaries and go online and forums and discuss this. And you know what? It's, 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 you're, I feel like you're kind of missing the, 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 more, the bigger point of the lesson in the story. Right. Is that men of God have lapses in faith. Right or wrong, you know, what Jesus was, ultimately what Jesus was doing by citing the story to the Pharisees is pointing out their own hypocrisy. Now, you're there in Matthew chapter 12. Let's look at it. Verse 1, it says, And at that time Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn, and his disciples were in hunger, and they began to pluck the ears of corn and to eat. Verse 2 but when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. But he said unto them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungered, and they that with him, how he entered the house of God, and to each the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat? So was it lawful for him to eat showbread? No, not exactly. Now, you could kind of say, this is where you can kind of start getting the semantics. Well, the way, because we know how the story plays out, some of the things that are said. This, and the facts of the situation. You know, it's interesting that, that he starts out by saying, have you not read? 
Maybe if they had known the story better or read the story, they would know that there were some things that took place in that story that might make it look like, though it's not lawful, it wasn't necessarily sinful. And again, we'll get into that. I'm trying not to be too confusing about this, again, because people go round and round about this type of thing. And I don't want to spend a lot of time on it because we'll miss the, the, greater, uh, the greater lesson in the story. But he does say here, look, it was not lawful for him to eat the showbread. And the, the reason why is because in the law, the, 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 the law is very clear in Leviticus, and we'll look at that in a minute, that, uh, that, that it was made for, the, the showbread was to be eaten by Aaron and his sons. Okay? It says, It was not lawful for him to eat, neither they that were with him, but only for the priest. Or have ye not read in law how that on the Sabbath days the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? So he's saying, look, there's, there's things that people do that if you want to get real technical about it, are sinful or not lawful at the very least. Jump down to verse 12. He says, how much, well, no, let's just read the rest of the passage because it's important. He says, verse 6, but I say to you that in this place there is one greater than the temple, but if he had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, you would have not condemned the guiltless. Saying, look, there's nothing wrong with what my disciples are doing. There, you know, there's nothing wrong with them, you know, fulfilling a need, plucking ears of corn and putting it in their mouth on the Sabbath day. For the Son of Man, verse 8, is the Lord of the Sabbath day. And when he was departed thence, he went into their synagogue, and behold, so he kind of, it's like he's going to go make a point now, right? He says, oh, you, want, you got a problem with me plucking ears of corn on the Sabbath day and eating? Watch this. So he goes right into their synagogue, right? And he says, and, and in verse 10, and behold, there was a man with which had a withered hand, and they asked him, saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? That they might accuse him. So these are the type of people, that all they're, they're more concerned about the letter of the law rather than the spirit of the law. They're more worried about sacrifice and not mercy. Okay, and he says here, verse 11, he said to them, what man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep? And if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, shall he not lay it and lift it and uh, uh, lay hold on it and lift it out? So he's citing, he's pointing out their own hypocrisy. And isn't that so often what, you know, the, 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 the super, you know, the hyper-religious, the hyper-spiritual types try to do, the, the, the pharisaical types who want to be, you know, lift themselves up, you know, they forget about their own sin. You know, they forget about the fact that they've got sin in their life, the things that they do that are wrong, and then they want to point the fingers at everybody else. And he says, will he not lift it out? Verse 12, how much then is a man better than a sheep? He's saying, you go lift up a sheep, and you're going to get after me for healing a guy with a withered hand on the Sabbath day in the temple? Wherefore, and he, get this, he says, it is lawful to do well on the Sabbath day. Then he saith unto the man, stretch forth thine hand, and he stretched it forth, that he restored it whole like as the other. So he's saying, you want an answer to question? It's lawful to do well on the Sabbath day. You know, Jesus is giving it a pass. He's saying, this is, this is good to do. This is a good thing to do. Because you have to remember, this is the, you know, this falls in, what is the greatest of the commandments? Thou shalt, you know, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength, right? We understand that. But the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So what's the, what's the greater law that we should obey here? Is doing good unto our neighbor. Right? I mean, what good would that have done that, that, that guy with the withered hand if Jesus said, well, it's a Sabbath day. Sorry, bud. Hey, guys, put that corn down. I know you're hungry. I know you've been working hard, but it's the Sabbath day. After all, we wouldn't want to offend anybody. He's saying, no, I love that. It is well, it's lawful to do well on the Sabbath day. You know, have some corn. Let me heal that hand. He even gives these guys a pass. You know, you're going to pluck out a sheep. Even the priests in the, in the law, you know, they, they're, they're given a pass for working in the temple on the Sabbath day. The, why? Because the greatest of the commandments is to, is, it is, is to love thy neighbor as thyself. It is lawful to do well on the Sabbath day. <coughs> I mean, think about, so, you know, bringing this back to David, you know, think about David's position. If Ahimelech had said, you know, you know, the only bread I have here is showbread, and you can't have any because you're not of the sons of Aaron. Sorry, you can't have that. You think David would have just admired how holy and righteous Ahimelech was? He just said, wow, man, you're just on another level. You're right, I'm so wicked. I'll just go starve to death now. No, that's not at all what would happen. He would not have admired the priest. He said in verse 3, Now therefore, what is in the under thine hand? Back in 1 Samuel 21. Give me five loaves of bread in mine hand, or what there is present. He's saying, give me something to eat. I'm starving. And we saw earlier, Jesus said he was in hunger and had need. Okay? This isn't just you know, his mid-afternoon snack that he's trying to fit in. He's been on the run for three days, probably hasn't eaten. You know, 
any one of us that goes more than, you know, <laughs> 12 hours or something like that, you know, you get hangry, right? Go three days without it. So, you know, you'll be more than hangry. You'll be, you'll be upset. You'll be weak. You'll be tired. You'll be all of these things. He said, uh, <laughs> he said, or what is there present? And the priest answered David and said, there is no common bread under mine hand, but there is hollowed bread. And notice that the priest, he's giving him this clause here. He's saying, if the young men have kept themselves at least from women. He's saying, look, for the la if, if you're at least clean in this way, then you could eat of this bread. Okay? So it's kind of like the priest is kind of putting his own clause in there. He's, you know, Himelech's kind of saying, you know, I, I've got this hollowed bread and I'll give it to you, but, you know, you've got to make sure that you're at least clean. And David, of course, assures him in verse 5, And David answered the priest and said unto him, If with truth women have been kept from us about these three days since I came out, and the vessels of the young man are holy, and the bread is in a manner common. So now David's kind of countering back and saying, Well, you know, I know it's whole bread, but it is in a manner common. Meaning this is that it's, it's, been t it's not like David's just walking into the holy place and taking it right off the table before the Lord. You know, he's just, you know, getting in there right next to the, you know, the, the, the golden candlestick and everything else and the showbread and, you're just taking it, you know, just throwing the veil open. Where's that bread at? I know you got it. That's not what's going on in the story. He's saying, look, the bread's in a manner common, meaning it's not in the holy place anymore. You've taken it out because that's what they did. <laughs> they would take it in there, you know, because here's the thing. God didn't show up and eat the bread, folks. You know, God, God doesn't eat the bread. You know, it was, it was symbolic. There's symbolic, a lot of symbology behind that bread. That's another interesting study, but, you know, they, God didn't let the bread rot either. And we'll see, if you go, go over to Leviticus 24, that, that God gave that bread to Aaron and his sons to, to eat. That it was theirs to eat. And I believe that's what he's saying. He's saying, The bread is in a manner common, yea, though it were sanctified this day in the vessel, so the priest, the priest gave him hollowed bread, for there was no bread but the show bread that was taken from before the Lord. So it's, the narrator is making it very clear. There was no bread but the showbread that was taken from before the Lord to put hot bread in the day when it was taken away. So this is the old showbread. It's in a manner common now. It's not like he's just marching right into the holy place and saying, hey God, are you going to finish that? And just eating it. He's asking for something that was the priests to eat. Now, <coughs> Jesus did clearly say it was unlawful for him to eat it, right? Meaning for him to have gone in there and taken that bread, that, that it wasn't necessarily appointed to David in the law to eat the holy the the, the, the showbread, because that showbread was appointed to somebody else. Look at Leviticus twenty four. Uh, you know, we'll just jump down to verse eight. It says in verse eight, every Sabbath day, this is you know referring to the showbread. He shall set in an order before the Lord continually, being taken from among the children of Israel by an everlasting covenant. Verse nine, and it shall be Aaron and his sons. Now notice the, there's there's a word missing here. It doesn't say Aaron and his sons only. It just says, look, this is Aaron and his sons. And it says, and they shall eat it in the holy place, for it is the most holy uh, unto the Lord and the offerings of the Lord made by fire by perpetual statute. So this bread was, was for Aaron and his sons to eat, but it was not exclusive. Okay, it wasn't exclusive. It was only exclusive in the sense that it was to be where it was to be eaten. They were to eat it in the holy place. Right? That's where that's the that's the clause they're saying, look, they're, it's for Aaron and sons. They are to eat it and they're to eat it in the holy place. <coughs> now David, he like I said, he pointed out that the bread is in a manner common, and the narrator clearly tells us that it was taken from before the Lord. Meaning Aaron and his sons, you know, the priest, Ahimelech, and whoever else was with them of, 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 of the sons of Aaron, they didn't finish it all. You know, they didn't eat everything in there. You know, they had some left over. They'd taken it out to put the fresh bread in. And he's saying, look, meaning this, and this is how I believe. This is my interpretation. And you know what? You might have a different interpretation. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. I'm not going to split hairs over this. But here's, well, here's my take on it. Is that when it's saying it's for Aaron and his sons, meaning this, that when, when they're done in the holy place, they can do whatever they want with it. I mean, what were they supposed to do with this bread? If they don't finish it. And then there's hot bread coming in the next day. And hot bread coming in the next day. I mean, there's just bread piling up. Well, you know, we're the only ones that are allowed to eat that. So, what you think they're just going to constantly, you know, at some point, are you going to eat the, the day-old stuff? The two-day-old stuff? The three-day-old stuff? Or are you going to eat the hot stuff that's coming in fresh? In the holy place. That's what the stuff you're going to eat. 
What are you going to do with that old showbread eventually? You're going to give it away, or what else? The garbage. You're going to pitch it. You're going to throw it away. <coughs> and, you know, so what I'm getting at is, this is my take on it, is that after Aaron and his sons have eaten the showbread in the holy place, and they've taken it out, and it's become a, in a manner common, I think they're kind of at liberty to do what they want with it. And if David shows up and says, I'm hungry, and he says, hey, look, I've got this, this showbread, and you can kind of see it with the Himalek already, he's already kind of a precursor to his, you know, the Pharisees are going to come after him. And you can have some if you've kept yourself from women. Where is that in the law? He's just, you know, just made, well, if you've at least done this, you can have some. Because after all, this is only for us. You're going to throw it out anyway, Ahimelech. Let's just let me eat. So he gives it to him. So the bread was for Aaron and his sons, but it's only exclusive in regards as to where it's to be eaten. It doesn't say it's for their sons only. I believe they had liberty there to do what they wanted with that. And you have to also remember that David, he received it at the hand of the priest by permission. He's asking, you know, and he's kind of making his case. Well, it's in a manner common. We've kept ourselves clean, you know. Can we eat this? And he says, yes. You know, and he eventually he gives it to him. And it's not as if he went into the holy place and stole it, okay? That's why it says in Matthew how he entered into the house of God and did eat the showbread when Jesus tells the story. He didn't march into the holy place. And the priest, you know, and he obliges them under this condition, so on and so forth. And, you know, Jesus is citing this story. And people, I mean, they just spend so much time talking about it. And really, all he's trying to do is point out the, the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. You know, that's, that's the thrust of the message in Matthew, Mark, and Luke when he brings this story up to the Pharisees in that context. He's just trying to point out their hypocrisy. Not teach situational ethics or whatever. You know, people go on and on about it, and they miss that. That's the thrust of that message. But let's just move on in the story here, because I, I you know, I spent a little bit of time on that, and I don't want to spend all night on it. Um, I think the, over, the, the greater lesson you can learn from the story is that yesterday's faith is today's failure. Yesterday's faith is today's failure. If Look, if you're trying to live the Christian life on the faith you had yesterday, you're going to fail. If you're trying to live the Christian life on, on the faith that you had last year, last week, last month, mark it down. It's only a matter of time until you stumble and fall. And I kind of brought this up you know, on Sunday with Paul, how Paul said I, you know, he, he, he forgets those things which are behind and, press, and he pressed forward towards the mark to the high calling of the prize in Christ Jesus. You know, he's not, and, and, I, and I made the application that he's not, Paul's not dwelling in his past glory. He's not living on yesterday's faith. He's forgetting, he said, I forget those things that are behind. Even the good things. I believe that's what Paul is saying there. He's saying, look, I'm not going to sit here and just dwell on everything I've already accomplished. I'm not going to just sit here and dwell on all the, all, the, all the things I have done and live on past glory. Because yesterday's faith is today's failure. And that's what you see in David in the story. And, and we'll see that here in a minute. Now look at verse 7 of 1 Samuel 21. It says, Now there was a certain man of the servants of Saul that was there that day, detained before the Lord, and his name was Doeg, an Edomite. You know, there's anyone looking for a baby name? Just kidding. And the chiefest of the herbin that belonged to Saul. <coughs> now, that's an important detail. If you know the story, you know why that's an important detail. That's going to come back up next week, okay? And David said unto Himelech, uh, And is there not under thy, here under thine hand spear or sword? I mean, David just showing up one needy guy. Like, I haven't got anything to eat. You got anything to eat? I don't have any, I don't have any weapon. You got a weapon? And this has got to be kind of suspicious to Ahimelech at this point. Aren't you the captain of thousands? Aren't you a warrior? And you're, and you're marching out without any weapons? That would definitely seem quite odd. And he said, For I have neither brought my sword nor my weapons with me, because the king's business required haste. He said, I had to leave so fast I couldn't even grab my sword. And he's already giving him the excuse. He's already giving him a reason why. He's already over-explaining things, right? You know, that's, you know, that's a good principle. A lot, oftentimes, that's how you can catch people in the lie. When they just start volunteering unnecessary information you didn't even ask for. Because they can kind of see it coming. They're trying to cover their tracks, right? He's saying, look, I, I need a sword. And he says, if I ask for a sword, you're going to wonder why I don't have a sword because I'm the captain of, the Lord, of, of, of Saul's host. And you're going to probably ask me why I didn't bring it. So let me just tell you right away. And it's to dispel all doubts. And what we see here in the story is that David... You know, he's lying. 
but he's lying out of desperation. His back is up against the wall. And what this shows us in the story is that when, when you force even good people into bad situations, they're going to resort to these kind of measures. Even good people, when they are put into this kind of a situation, will just start lying. Just, you know, that's just part of human nature. And, you know, we should know, you know, this is kind of setting us up to, for, 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 uh, to, to remind us about David that he's a man like anybody else, that he's a man of like passions. You know, and of course, we, we know that David, you know, commits other sins later in his life. And what it's showing us is that, you know, there's no temptation that has taken you but such as common to man. You know, the people in the Old Testament that do all these great things, the great victories that they wrought, it wasn't because they were so special. They're just like me and you. They're men of like passions. It's because of the faith that they had in God. That's what makes the difference. You know, and here's the thing. What am I trying to say is that, you know, we can have, you know, we can, we can do just as great of things for God today as they did back then if we have the faith that they had. If we had the faith that, that David had, you know, we could do great things that he did. And this, you know, we, I love that God puts these type of stories in there where we, we look at David and we, you know, we step back and we say, what's, man, lying? And it gets worse later in his life. Murder, adultery. I'm not saying that gives us, you know, a, a, a pass to do those things. We shouldn't do those things. But do people do those things? Do Christian do, Christians do those things? Do even people that we would say are good, godly people end up doing these things sometimes? They do. And it's unfortunate, but it happens. And when you even put the, some of the best people in the worst cir circumstances, don't be surprised if even they fall. Even they mess up. You say, oh, you know, I just thought that person would never do something like this. I can't believe it. Why? And, it, and it's the strangest thing when people build other people up. So they put them on such a lofty height. And then they're shocked when they find out that they're, they're just human after all. You know, and that's something that's real important to keep in mind. Uh, you know, especially when you're dealing with, you know, you know, people that, you know, leaders and things like that. And it, it's the weirdest thing to watch people put people on, on such a lofty height and then just get so surprised when they have some flaw in them. Mm -hmm. There's something wrong with them. And here's the reason why, because they're not God. <laughs> they're like me and you. I mean, wouldn't you say David was a mighty man of God? And when you say David was, was you know, the, the, just one of the greatest people in the Bible, I mean, he's slaying bears, he's slaying lions, he's taking on Goliath. What a great man of God. And yet, even in, the, in a situation like this where he's just hungry, total lapse in faith, on, an, on the run for his life. <laughs> they resort to, to these measures, even the good people. Now look at here, David's asking for the sword, right? And, and of course, we know the story, verse 9, and the priest said, the sword of Goliath, the Philistine, whom thou slewest in the valley of Elah, behold, it is here wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If thou wilt take that, take it, for there is none other save that here. And David said, there is none like that. Give it me. Now, this is an interesting part of the story. And I've often wondered what this meant, you know, what exactly is going on here. But you have to put yourself in David's shoes. Okay, you always try to look at this through his eyes. You know, and of course, we don't know everything that was going on in his heart and mind, but... You know, we're, we're human like he is, and we can kind of maybe get a sense of what he might have felt in this moment. Think about this. You're David, okay? You're just this shepherd boy. You go down, you're just obeying your father one day to go deliver bread and cheese to your older brothers who are fighting this war for Saul. And you see this great big Philistine come out, defying the armies of Israel, and you, in your righteous zeal, take this guy on with a sling, and you kill him with one stone. You fall him. You cut off his head with his own sword. And then people are singing your praises. You're elevated to this uh, lofty position in the king's army. Eventually, you're the king's son-in-law. I mean, you've, you've, you're on the rise. You know, God's blessed him. I mean, this is what happened to David. And now he's on the run for his life. He's had, a, you know, he's had the spear thrown at him. He's had to separate with his, from his best friend. He doesn't know if he's going to see him again. He doesn't know what's going to happen tomorrow. All he knows is that Saul is going to hunt him down. And he doesn't have a sword. But he gets here, and he gets, and he gets uh, to, 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 to Nob here, and he's in the house of God. And he asks for a sword, and which sword does he hand him? The sword that he took off Goliath and cut off his own head with. Now you must, you know, when, I, when you would read this, you would think, man, that must have been such an exhilarating moment. 
I tend to think it might have been a pretty dis- dis- depressing moment for, so- for David. To think, he might have picked up that sword and think, How, what's happening? <laughs> Where is the God of Israel that helped me to accomplish this victory? Right. And that might have been a reminder to him, like, hey, you're, you're, you're living on yesterday's faith. You can't just count on the fact that you slayed the Goliath yesterday to carry you through your whole life. You had a great victory in the past, David. You've done some great things for God. And here's that sword. But where, are you, where, where is he picking up that sword? On the run when he's lying to the priest. He's going to church and lying. <laughs> and eating the bread and he's needy. And he hands him that sword. And I just can't help but think of David's holding that sword and thinking, man, I've, I've, come, I've, come, I've fallen. Not necessarily fallen into sin, but man, I've, I've been brought low. I mean, he doesn't say, you know, he said, David said, there is none like it. Give it me. And he knows it was a great sword. It was a great victory. But, it, you know, it would appear in the story that David's faith has waned a little bit, hasn't it? I think we could all see that. I mean, when he's, I mean, God could have fed him. God could have protected him. God could do any of these number of things. But what does he do? He runs to man and asks, you know, for food. He asks for sword, these things. His faith is waned. And he's being reminded, I think, in this story of the faith that he had when he slew Goliath. And it's interesting, the story goes on, he gets these other reminders of Goliath that, you know, which was like, I guess you would say it was probably like the peak of his, his faith. I mean, that was when he was just the most, I mean, what other act did he do that, was, that you could really compare to that? And that was a huge act of faith. You know, we just read it in the story and it sounds cool. But when we put ourselves in, that, in, our, in his shoes and really think about what happened that day, this kid going to take on this giant, literally, huge, huge step in faith. I mean, I mean, that guy had such great faith to go and do that. But now here he is begging bread. Not, you know, it, he's waned. You know, he's in the right place. I'll give him that. He's in church, right? He's in the right place. He went to Ahimelech. He went to the house of God. He's even eating the bread, you know. It goes to show us, you know, you can be in church. You could have the bread, right? You could be eating the bread every day. But do you have the faith? Do you have the faith? Because, and you won't really know until you get put in a position where that faith is tested in life. And we know, you know, we're probably not going to have anybody hunt us down, although there will be a generation eventually that will, you know, in the Antichrist and so forth. That's another story. That'd be a good Halloween story, right? Kind of scary. But what about, you know, something more realistic? Maybe a disease. Maybe a loss of a loved one. You lose a job. You lose a family member. Whatever. Life itself has a way of testing our faith. And it's great that we're, if we're in church, like David, it's great that if we're, you know, eating God's bread in the, in the Bible... But you know what? We need to have the faith. And you can't just rely on the faith that you had yesterday to carry you through life. Because life is just one trial after another. One trial after another. And we get the victory here, and we get the victory there, and sometimes we stumble here and we stumble there. But if all you're counting on is the victories that you won in the past, don't, find, don't be surprised if you find yourself like David here. You know, picking up that sword and going, I remember how much faith I used to have. I remember when I went and did this. What's changed? Something's different now. My faith has waned. <clears throat> He's not walking by faith in the story. I don't, I don't believe it. <clears throat> and this is evidenced by the fact that after he's been fed, after he's been armed, what's he do next? Look at verse 10. And David arose and fled that day for fear of Saul. He's still on the run. And he went to Achish, the king of Gath. So he flees to the king of Gath. Now that, name, that place, Gath, should remind you of somebody. Where was Goliath from? From Gath. Goliath, whose sword he was now wielding, who he took off his own dead body and cut off his own head with, was the champion of Gath. David's running back to the place where the giant grew up. His hometown. The enemy of God. He's running to the Philistines at this point. You, I, I do not believe that David's walking by faith in the story. And I believe God allows us to see this because of the fact that 
you know, he's a man just like the rest of us. He's a human being just like the rest of us. We all have weakness. And no matter how much faith we might have today, you know, it, it matters how much faith we're going to have when that faith is actually tested. And people, I'm telling you, they, their faith falls out all the time. Sometimes it's not even something that happens to them. They see something happen to somebody else. And they say, well, you know, I, I don't know. I just can't believe God would do that. And they just quit. They quit on church. The church goes through some trial or something. The church gets attacked. People, oh, I'm just done. I quit. You know, this whole Christianity thing, I'm just, I'm over it. And they quit on God because they have no faith. Oh, they were soul winners. They were, you know, they were going to church three times a week, reading their Bible. They knew it. Up one side and down the other. They were winning souls. But one day their faith was tested. And, well, it's back to Philistines, back to the world, back to Gath. You cannot rely on the faith of yesterday to see us through the trials of tomorrow. And there's going to be trials. It's very interesting where he ends up with that sword in Gath. And what he's showing us here is that, you know, you have to walk daily with the Lord. That's the point I want to make in this, in this, in this message tonight, is that you have to walk daily with God. You have to determine every day that today I'm going to have faith and walk with the Lord. Not say, well, I did yesterday, and I did the day before, so I'm good. You're setting yourself up for a fall if that's, if that's how you approach the Christian life. Every day you have to get up. Paul said, you know, I die daily. You have to put on the new man every day. Just like you would put on your clothes every day. I mean, sometimes we sleep on... No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> right? But we get up every day, we put on new clothes. And we walk out the door, and we go face the world. You know what you got to put on? But the Bible says you have to put on the new man, too. Just like you, as, as, just as sure as you would put your clothes on, make sure you're putting on the new man every day. You're getting up, you're getting in the Word, you're praying, and you're determining in your heart that today I'm going to walk by faith. Today, if my faith is tested, I'll walk by faith. I'm not just going to say, well, I'm sure if I'm tested, I'll, I'll be okay, because after all, I had faith back then. That's what David, that's what David could have said. Well, hey, I slew Goliath. I should be all right. I should have to worry about this ever again. I mean, I've been at the mountaintop with God. And then another trial comes. Where's his faith? It's, not, it's nowhere to be found in this chapter. <clears throat> you cannot rely on the faith of yesterday to see you through tomorrow's trials. You have to walk with the Lord daily through the good times and the bad. And if you would, uh, well, just stay where you're at, but you know, if you fail to do this, you know, you're playing the fool with the Christian life. You're just playing, you're just being a fool with your Christian life. And that's what happened to David. Look at verse 11. And the servants of Achish said unto him, Is not this David the king of the land? So even the, even the heathen, they're already saying he's the king. He even know it, right? Did that they sing one to another of him in dances and singing and, and saying, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands? It's interesting that he didn't bring up and he slew Goliath. Remember that? And David laid up these words in his heart and was sore afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. And he changed his behavior before him and feigned himself mad. What does it mean to feign something? To fake it. He didn't actually go insane. He's faking it. This is what happens when people have lapses in their faith. They start lying. They find themselves in places they shouldn't be. They'll find themselves with the enemies of God. And then they find out, oh, and then they get afraid of that. Then they'll start acting crazy. Literally, he's acting crazy. And he feigned himself mad in their hands and scrabbled on the doors of the gate. Now, I don't think that means he busted out the board and the, you know, the, the tiles and started playing Scrabble. You know, I probably should have looked up what the word Scrabble means, but I always got the picture of him like clawing at the door, kind of like, ah, you know, scrabbling at the door. It's not a word you use all the time. But he scrabbled on the doors of the gate and let the spittle fall down upon his beard. I'm not going to reenact this as much as I'd like to. <laughs> Pop in an Alka-Seltzer and just like, he's like foaming at the mouth. He's acting like a crazy man, just <laughs> spit coming down. Because they're like, what, what, isn't this David? Isn't he the king of the land? Didn't I say 10,000s? They're going to notice the sword in a minute. They're going to remember what I did to their, their champion here in a second. Let me just play mad, distract him. 
when you fail to walk by faith, this is the kind of things that happen. Now, you might not literally do this in your life. But you might find yourself, you know, quitting, you know, getting out of church, you know, running back to the world. And then you're going back to the, and they're, oh, well, aren't you a Christian? Or, well, didn't you go to that church? Well, uh, I'm a recovering fundamentalist. <laughs> I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm getting therapy. <laughs> People do this type of thing. They feign themselves mad. They make up stories. They pretend to be something they're not to save their own skin. Then said Achish unto his servants, Lo, you see, this man is mad. Wherefore have you brought him to me? And they're like, well, he wasn't like that when he got here. <laughs> kind of a funny story. The way that people react to things like this, the narrative that plays out. Why did you bring this guy here? Well, no, he, I, he wasn't like this a second ago, I swear. He was, he was talking, he, was, he wasn't doing any of this. There was no foam, there was no scrabbling. This was David. We were excited, and we're saying, hey, this is... This is you know, the king of the land. You see this man. Where have you brought him to me? Have I need of, a mad, of mad men? Why have you brought this fellow to play the madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come in my house? He said, I don't want anything to do with him. You know, the world can't stand a faithless Christian either. The world doesn't want anything to do with backslidden Christians either. They, 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 don't, want to be, they don't want you in their house either. They don't want you in their presence either. You know, they have more respect for a Christian who might, you know, who might not go along with their sin, who might not go along with everything that they're doing, but at least they'll respect it. Say, look, I don't agree with your stance. I don't agree with the Bible. I don't agree with what you believe. I don't agree with the way you live your life, but I can respect it. Because at least you have some integrity. But when Christians lack faith, when they fall, and then they go back to the world, and they start acting like the world, or, you know, acting a fool, or being, trying to be something they're not, the world sees right through that. And they don't want anything to do with it. Say, oh, you know, you went to that church. You said this. You said that. I remember all that. You know what? You're a big fake. You're a phony. Just get out of here. <clears throat> then you're really alone. You know, and this could happen to us. I'm not saying this exact story. You know, but maybe. <laughs> I don't know that anyone's going to, you know, if you have a lapse in faith tonight, if you're going to, Go drool all over yourself somewhere. But you can make application. You know, you can do that. Maybe you'll end up, you know, in a place you shouldn't be. Doing something you shouldn't do. And everyone else is just, all the people around you, just looking at you going, pathetic. You know, we don't want to be around you either. This kind of thing can happen if you do what? If you fail to walk by faith daily. If you, you cannot live the Christian life on yesterday's faith. Yesterday's faith is today's failure. Your faith has to be fresh every single day. Every single day. You've got to wake up, put that new man on. Go over to Hebrews chapter 3. We're going to end there tonight. Hebrews chapter 3. You know, and this is why it's important to be in church. This is why it's important to be in the Word of God. This is why it's important to make have your fresh with your faith with you fresh every day you have to get up every day and say today i'm going to live for god today i'm going to live for god today i'm going to do the right thing not oh i did yesterday i well i've been living for god for the last three months i'm okay today i'm sure i'll be all right i don't need to pray i don't need i don't need to do any of these things yeah but then that day turns into two days that turns into a week that turns into a month next thing you know you're in gath you might have a cool sword you might have some trophies from the past but they're not going to help you today. Look at verse, Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12. It says this, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Now he's talking you know, to Christians here. Take heed, brethren. Right? Brothers in Christ. You know what it tells me? That even in a Christian, your faith can lapse and there can be even in a saved person an evil heart of unbelief. Not of, you know, I'm stopping believing in the Lord and all that nonsense. And they're not saying that they become unsaved or something like that. But that Christians who are saved can, can, can have lapses in their faith. And do what? Have an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. And just saying, well, I'm not going to walk with God anymore. They can be like David. I'm going to go back to, I'm going to go over to Gath, see what's going on over there. I'm going to go back and find the old friends and see what they're up to. 
I'm going to go back to the world and go back to the things I used to do and see what's going on. See what I missed. Because you have an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. But notice it says in verse 13, but exhort one another daily. Daily. Exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Look, this is something you have to do every single day. We have to exhort one another daily. You know, when you think about it, people will say, well, three times a week in church, but the Bible says daily. If anything, you know, we're, we're, lack, we're, we're lacking in this de the church department. You know, I'm not saying that we need, we need to be doing that we're in sin or something. But, I mean, Paul here is saying, look, we need to be exhorting one another daily. Always checking each other. You know one way you can exhort somebody? Is to pray for them. You know, we could pray for one another daily. You know, or you could see a brother who's kind of getting out of sorts. Lord, maybe you haven't seen him in a while. Text him. Call him. Hey, I'm thinking about you. I'm praying about you. Just wanted to exhort you. Lest they depart from the Lord lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. You know, that's, that's a scary thing about sin, is how quickly it hardens us to the things of God. That's why we have to be exhorted daily. Well, today, you know, I'm not going to walk by faith. I'm just going to enjoy some sin today. But that sin today can harden your heart. And you think, well, tomorrow I'll get right with God. Tomorrow I'll start living for the Lord again. But you know what? That, 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 that's, what that's the deceitfulness of sin. And it'll harden your heart, and then harden your heart a little more, and then harden your little heart a little bit more. And next thing you know, a whole month, two months, a whole year, decades go by for Christians. They're not in church. They're not reading their Bibles. They don't talk to God. They don't walk with God. They don't care about souls. People around them don't even know they're saved. They don't even know, oh, you're a Christian? I never would have known if you hadn't told me. Why? Well, because one day I just said, today I'm not going to walk by faith. Today, I'm just going to have a little lapse in faith. Because, you know, I've, I've lived for God for so long, and I've done so many great things in the past, I can afford to have one day, two days, just have a little lapse in my faith. Just take a little vacation from God. But you know what? That's deceitfulness of sin. That's going to harden your heart. And, and here's the thing. It says right there, lest there be in any one of you, meaning all of us, we're all prone to this. Look, if it can get to David... If David, a man like David, could have a lapse in faith, do you think maybe we could too? Do you think maybe we should take heed and make sure that we're walking daily with the, war, with the Lord lest we find ourselves in that same position, playing a fool, scrabbling at the door, pretending to be something we're not, and rejected? So that's the message tonight, is that you, know, you cannot just rely on yesterday's faith to carry you through the Christian life. You know, you can't be like David just saying, well, I slew Goliath, so I, I should be good now. You know, you, when, you should, when you go through a hard time, you're going to need faith. You're going to need faith that day. You're not going to be able to just go into some trial and say, well, I went through that other trial. You're going to have to have faith for every single trial you go through. You have to stay faithful every single time you go through it. And they're going to come. Yea, and all they that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. It will happen. So, you know, be prepared. You know, take the steps now to be ready to face that by walking daily with the Lord, by having fresh faith every day so that you don't fall. Let's go ahead and pray.